Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining Green Energy Consumers Alliance for this lunchtime webinar on the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030. My name is Mal Skoron. I'm the Transportation Policy and Program Coordinator for Green Energy Consumers Alliance. And I'm joined by our director, uh, Larry Cretion, um, for this webinar. So before we get started, um, just a couple of logistics. First off, everyone is muted to avoid background noise, but we do want to answer your questions and encourage as much participation as possible. So feel free to send questions as they occur to you into the GoToWebinar go to box on your screen, and we will get to them at the end of every section, or at least a few of them, and then uh, have a dedicated Q&A portion at the end to get to the questions um, uh, as they come. So we'll get started. I think some folks are still trickling in, um, but we can go ahead. If you're not familiar with Green Energy Consumers Alliance, we're a nonprofit organization based in Boston and in Providence. And our mission is to harness the power of energy consumers to speed the transition to a low carbon future. We achieve that mission in two parallel ways. The first is through our clean energy programs. So we have a few programs to help uh, folks in Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, get greener electricity at a very reasonable price, um, sometimes lower than what you would typically pay for a basic service with the utility program we're very proud of. Um, we also have an electric vehicle program to help folks compare different electric cars that are on the market um, to be able to choose the low carbon car that's right for them. Um, and a couple of other programs as well, such as Shape the Peak, which is a notification system to help uh, uh, electricity users in Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, understand when electricity is the most expensive and most polluting so that they can curtail their usage um, to provide society-wide benefits to everyone. Um, but the second parallel way that we achieve our mission is through our advocacy. So we know that policy can be a very powerful tool to help advance clean energy solutions. And so we're hard at work uh, trying to understand what both Massachusetts and Rhode Island are doing to help achieve their climate goals. Today's webinar is gonna focus on the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030. So this plan outlines all of the strategies that the state expects to take in order to meet its uh, ambitious and very achievable climate targets for 2025 and 2030. So we're gonna walk through the timeline and background of the plan so that you understand some context going into this webinar, and then talk about the three largest emitting sectors and what the state plans to do in each of them. So that's buildings, transportation, and electric power in that order. And then finally, we'll end with uh, our Q&A portion and a couple of opportunities for you to get engaged with our work if you'd like to learn more about what we do um, and participate a little more fully. With that, I'm going to pass the uh, mic off to our Executive Director, Larry Cretion, to talk about the background of this Clean Energy and Climate Plan. Larry? Uh, thank you, Mel, and hello, everybody. Um, before I get started uh, on the, our interpretation of Governor Baker's Clean Energy and Climate Plan. I just want to sort of perhaps state the obvious. Um, if you're at this webinar, you, you're probably well aware that last week, uh, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia said that he's not going to support uh, what we think are the key parts of climate legislation that uh, President Biden has been trying to pass for since he got elected. Um, and that is tragic. There's just no sugarcoating that. Um, and that's why more than ever, we need some state action, but there's no substitution for something that would affect all 50 states and our territories, right? Um, and you may have also heard just announced today, uh, President Biden is coming to Somerset, Massachusetts at the site of the former Brayton Point coal power plant um, to talk about, perhaps we're hoping that he'll talk about using executive powers to uh, declare uh, the climate crisis, the emergency that it is. Um, so perhaps you can join us in your own way to welcome uh, the president uh, to Massachusetts on Wednesday. Um, while we're talking about this, uh, the Massachusetts House and Senate are negotiating uh, in what's called the Climate uh, Conference Committee uh, to 
produce what we're hoping is a great uh, climate bill for 2022. Um, and we're gonna talk about that as we go. Uh, and when we see the bill come out, uh, it may come out this week, we're hoping, um, we will schedule another webinar where we talk about what the uh, that bill uh, is doing for us. Uh, but this is about um, a requirement that Governor Baker had, according to the Global Warming Solutions Act, which was to produce a clean energy and climate plan to spell out um, how at least he would go about reducing emissions to comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and in particular, uh, and as you may know, in 2021, the Global Warming Solutions Act was essentially amended by another bill called the Roadmap Bill um, that specified that uh, the governor had to come up with a with a, some rules about how to get to uh, our emission reductions by uh, 2025, 2030, and, and 2050. So what this graph is showing you is the squiggly line on the left is our uh, the state's historic greenhouse gas emissions and uh, what the new law says and what the plan says is by uh, 2025, we have to reduce emissions 33%, a third below what the emissions were in 1990. That's the, uh, the first big um, red dot you see there. And then in uh, 2030, it's going to have to be 50% uh, below um, 1990. And then it's 75% by 2040. The law says um, that by 2050, there has to be emission reductions of 15, I'm sorry, of 85% uh, below 1990, but we would have to have a net zero economy in Massachusetts, meaning that um, somehow there would have to be a way to capture 15% uh, of the emissions by 2050 to get us to net zero. Um, some of us are uh, saying that we don't really know how we're gonna do that yet, and we were glad to see that this plan would go a little further than the law says. It would say that we have to reduce emissions by 90% by 2050. Um, but to be honest with you, our organization focuses mostly on the next five to 10 years, because if we don't get those years right, we're just not gonna get um, our, hit our goal for 2050. So we're really pushing for uh, rules that would get us to the 33% by 2025 and the 50% by 2030. Uh, next slide, Mel. So here's a little uh, table, a timetable showing what's going on. Um, so left to right, um, the first draft of the Clean Energy and Climate Plan that we're talking about today came out quite a while ago, um, 18 months ago. We looked at that, we talked about that, and then we commented on that as an organization. Many of you probably commented as individuals. Uh, then in March of 2021, the legislature passed a very good climate roadmap bill, um, and that sort of ups the ante on climate policy. Um, I think we're all going to have to be prepared for almost annual climate bills because things change, technologies change, markets change, and uh, we're all getting scared about what's happening, and we should keep uh, raising the bar. Um, so then... Uh, we in April there was another comment period on the on the on a draft plan, but right now we're talking about the final plan is released. Now I want to be very clear that this is a plan to make policy. This is not policy by itself. Um, legislation makes policy. Uh, regulations make policy. And um, so what we're looking we're going to describe to you what the executive branch is looking at, and then we will um, um, uh, be looking at. Um, uh, what kind of provisions we'll be looking for in the coming months. It's important to realize, you know, Governor Baker's not running for re-election. We all know that. And so we will have a new governor. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about will depend really on the implementation by the next governor of Massachusetts. Next slide. So here are the reductions um, by sector. The legislature required... Uh, uh, line by line uh, sector reductions. So it's a little busy, but um, as I said, by 2030, they have to get to 50% reduction overall in Massachusetts. And uh, the governor chose 33% for the uh, target for 2025. But there are requirements, uh, the residential heating and cooling space 
will have to re reduce emissions 49 percent commercial heating and cooling 49 percent that's basically the same as the overall goal transportation is being reduced by 34 percent and transportation is the number one emitter and as you can see it's a challenge and so evidently in this plan they didn't see ways of getting transportation to go further than that and we'll talk about that electric power has already produced most of the emission reductions in our economy but it has a lot more to give and so there's opportunity there to go deeper um, so those are the three big sectors we're going to talk about heating transportation and electric power and how do we get to 50 percent by 2030 next slide Uh, this slide uh, shows you the, the slope of the line um, for each of the sectors I just mentioned. And so, uh, as you can see, transportation is number one now, and it's going to be number one by a lot in 2030. Uh, electric power is going down a lot, and it's going to keep going down. Um, uh, space heating and uh, trans is, is a challenge, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get into the details there. Um, the good news, which I hope every one of you will absorb and talk about it at your barbecues and whatnot, um, this plan was was uh, very well studied, and it said if we if we get to the 50% emission reductions by doing supporting the clean energy e economy, we're actually going to grow the state's economy and have a gain of 22,000 additional jobs. Not only that, but 95% of the new jobs are going to be middle to high wage. Middle being defined as something over uh, $26 per hour, and a fair number of jobs uh, would be uh, over $35 an hour. Uh, we're talking about um, people who would be qualified tradespeople primarily, um, like the people there who are installing a heat pump. We're talking about electricians and uh, so forth. And so it's a great opportunity uh, for the economy. Now, how are we going to pay for those jobs? We're going to pay for those jobs um, by reducing our petroleum consumption primarily and our gas consumption. Uh, we uh, import all of our petroleum and natural gas in the state. And by doing less of that, we're going to save the average household about $400 per year. Um, we'll pay a little bit more perhaps in our electricity rate and our gas rate and maybe on heating oil, but we're going to pay a lot less um, in the end because we'll be. Uh, uh, using it less for gas and for oil and for gasoline and um, we'll be paying essentially for efficiency um, and then the air quality will result and th this has to be emphasized the annual benefits are 400 million dollars per year in uh, public health benefits and you may have read just the other day Boston College came out with another report they can actually put a number on how many people will die prematurely because of air pollution Pretty much in every town in Massachusetts and um, just think about it if the air pollution um, raised your health insurance cost I think we'd all probably deal with the situation faster but right now um, uh, well it does pay for our health insurance indirectly uh, but the reality is we should be having the fossil fuel industry pay for our health insurance uh, cost and, and this plan essentially is trying to um, internalize those costs and, and so we can save the $400 million per year. Uh, next slide. Um, a big uh, improvement from the of the final plan over the draft is that they are now doing a better job of addressing the issues of environmental justice. So what is that? Uh, studies have shown that um, air pollution in particular is concentrated mostly in areas where uh, people who are low and moderate income live, people who are people of color, uh, people who uh, English isn't their first language. Uh, they just don't have uh, the same political power as maybe the rest of us. And so it's concentra concentrated. And this map shows you where diesel particulate pollution uh, is concentrated, um, obviously in greater Boston, but also in other places like um, the South Coast and Springfield. Um, and th this plan commits to meaningfully engaging uh, people in the communities that are most affected. Um, and there's going to be a lot more air quality monitoring. So it, we want to monitor the air at a local level so that we can find out more about how we can fix it. So it's in the most, a lot of it's coming from trucks, a lot of it's coming from cars, 
a lot of it's coming from power plants and, and factories, but we can uh, create better policies uh, at a local level if we, if we know where they are. Next slide. So now I'm gonna go a bit into what the plan has to say about reducing uh, energy needs in buildings. So as I said, most of the emissions are gonna come, uh, it's gonna be the shooting for 49% emission reductions by uh, 2030. Um, and it's, it's going to be 29% um, by 2025 for the residential sector and 35% uh, for the uh, commercial and industrial uh, sector. Next slide. Um, this is something we're all gonna have to get acquainted with. The, the biggest policy that is being discussed in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan is what is called a clean heat standard. Um, to sort of simplify it, what it says, if you wanna sell fossil fuels in Massachusetts for heating, that you're maybe you're the gas company, maybe you're a heating oil company, a propane company, um, something like that. If you wanna sell, you're gonna to have to earn credit. You're gonna to have to uh, participate by doing paying into something that will reduce uh, heating emissions in Massachusetts. So that could be paying to have heat pumps installed either on at your customers or, or somewhere else, maybe paying for weatherization um, in a building or something. The, thing, the, the details of that are, uh, are not yet determined. There's a there's parallel to the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. There's a Clean Heat Commission that's working, and their recommendations will be uh, coming out in the fall of 2022, where I think we're going to see a lot more detail. And this is going to be something our organization is going to watch very, very carefully. There, um, Oregon has a program like this that we're watching. Uh, Vermont came very close to passing some legislation that would create a clean heat standard. Um, we think that a clean heat standard is um, essential. It has to set, the, the standard has to get um, more stringent every year in order to get to the uh, 49 or 50% uh, reduction in greenhouse gases that we need by 2030. Um, but there's just a whole lot of detail work that goes with it. And um, so here's a little pie chart showing where we're getting the emissions from uh, essentially space heating. So a lot of it is for um, natural gas is our predominant heating fuel. Uh, it's becoming more so every day. It's sort of eating away at the heating oil and propane industries. Uh, but it, essentially what, where, what I want you to think about is this, is this will be a requirement on anyone selling um, fossil fuel heat. And um, so we're, we're gonna have to create a, a bit of a bureaucracy to make it happen, um, but it's gonna be worthwhile because it's essentially we have to drive down emissions in this sector. Um, next slide. Now there's other policies behind the, besides the Clean Heat Commission. I would say the Clean Heat Commission is number one uh, in terms of its impact um, by 2030. Um, but there's also um, a lot of discussion about what kind of a stretch code we should have. And there are regulations that have been drafted by the state and you can make comment on them until August. Um, and so the stretch code is something that allows a city or town uh, to adopt that would go beyond the state's requirement. Um, the basic building code, building energy code is what it, um, if you wanna build something new or substantially renovate a home or an office building or any other kind of building, there's the state building code, and then there's your local stretch code. The stretch code has been defined and redefined over time. So is the base energy code. Um, and they need to keep being refined over time as we have new opportunities uh, to reduce energy consumption. It's generally far cheaper in new construction to go all electric um, because we can tighten the envelope and use passive building design. We can do a number of things. Um, uh, we can adopt uh, high performance heat pumps in the building so we can get away from uh, fossil fuels. Um, and so we're looking for a strong stretch code uh, here. We may see that come out in the legislation that we're all talking about that should be done by the end of the week. Um, the next big slide, sorry, the next big um, 
policy that we're looking for is called building performance standards. Um, and it can coexist with the clean heat standard. What the building performance standard says is, in Boston is the leader on this one. It has a, a, a standard called uh, BIRDO, um, Building Emissions Reduction Performance um, Ordinance. And um, the state is looking towards uh, moving in that direction. What that says is if you're a large building of say 20,000 square feet or above, or I believe it's 15 residential units or above, um, you would annually have to report your emissions to uh, the city of Boston. And annually, you would eventually be having to reduce the emissions that emanate from your building, that are measured from your building. Boston is just now beginning to implement that program for a couple of years. They had a policy where buildings had to report to the state. What um, this plan contemplates, the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan, says that they would move towards developing a method for large buildings to report their uh, energy use and, and emissions uh, to the Commonwealth. So it's a it's a step along the way. We'd like to see it uh, accelerated. Uh, we think it's going to have to be a a, uh, a policy like Boston's in place by 2025, so that it can have impact by 2030. Um, and there are ways, and we'll get into this in a future webinar about how it can work together with the Clean Heat Standard. The the plan also talks about um, a home energy rating system. Um, where if you want to buy or sell a home, you'd be able to look at uh, what the energy consumption is of the home. And so if you were looking at two homes, they both cost the same amount of money, or you wanted to rent an apartment and the rent is the same, but one is far more efficient than the other, it would be nice to know uh, that it would be more efficient and cheaper to, to heat uh, and to power. Um, the plan doesn't go as far in that as we would like. Um, and so we'd like to push along for that because we think we have to put everything on the table to get to 50% by 2030. Pretty much every tool that we can to educate consumers and to empower consumers to reduce fossil fuel consumption. And uh, finally, there's going to be a lot of discussion in the next year about the future of the gas utility. Um, so we know that the gas utility is predominant in Massachusetts and uh, but we have to uh, phase out gas and we've got to get to zero by 2050. And so how do we do that? It's a complicated process. The infrastructure that we all have, um, all of us who have gas heat are paying for that. We want to make sure that we decommission the gas utility sensibly over time and we do it fairly so that uh, the last few people with gas heat aren't paying the entire bill. Uh, that would not be fair. We certainly don't want to stick uh, low and moderate income people with the tab um, for something like that. Um, so it has to be done and it will be engaged as an organization on that. Um, next slide. Um, however you think about it, all these different policies, just what, it, what they're going to require essentially is the installation of almost 1 million heat pumps by 2030. And so what this slide shows is um, where we would go if we kept going at the current rate, which is in orange, um, that's sort of the expected um, uh, rate of heat pump adoption. Uh, we're behind significantly in our goals on heat pump adoption. Um, it's 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 harder than one would think. Um, people are confused about what kind of heat pump would be best for their home. Heat pumps uh, cost a bit more upfront to purchase. People are kind of used to their gas or their heating oil, and uh, but th it's going to be essential. We essentially have to get away from fossil fuels and onto heat pumps. What the green line shows is the trajectory, the slope that we need. We just need to keep adding over 100,000 heat pumps per year uh, between now and 2030. Next slide. No. Uh, this slide also, uh, Mal does a great job. This is showing um, what the goal was for heat pumps um, and uh, 2020 and how many were installed by 2020. Um, that, that's through the Mass Save program. 
So as recently as just last year, we were seeing that uh, the Commonwealth's just slow at adopting heat pumps. Um, and we, we just can't continue that anymore. We've got to get back to the rate. We've got to get to the rate of about 100,000 heat pumps uh, per year. Next slide. So now I'll turn it over to Mal. Uh, uh, so we're about to reach the transportation section, but before I go ahead and talk. Can you hear me? It seems like it's not no, going through. Now I can hear ah, you. Okay. Can hear you. Sorry. Not. Sorry about that, folks. Thanks for letting me know in the chat. That was really helpful. Um, there was a question that came in uh, the building section before we move on to talking about transportation, which is, um, Larry, you were talking about the ability to compare the efficiency of homes and buildings. And uh, the question was whether that would be voluntary or whether sellers and owners of homes would have to provide that information. Yeah, uh, the plan, this plan doesn't go into that level of important detail. Um, and so we wish that they had spent more time on that. Maybe that report of the Clean Heat Commission by the end of the fall will have something more. Um, I'd like to see progress in either direction. Um, maybe we do something that is voluntary for um, a couple of years and move towards something that would be um, uh, required. I mean, right now, as you know, when you buy a car, it comes with on it a, uh, a label that tells you how many miles per gallon. Um, if you were to buy an appliance, it, they're required to tell you how much uh, energy they use. Um, they can tell you whether or not it's an ENERGY STAR rated. Um, appliance and so you, that's a good indication that it's efficient um, and so honestly we think that it should be uh, required but it's not in the plan right now um, I guess there was a pilot program in Springfield a few years ago that indicated that um, in that pilot program people who um, uh, knew what how efficient their building was their home was relative to others I uh, significantly increased their um, a participation in the mass save program and they got more energy audits and they installed more energy saving opportunities great one more question before we move on um, can you say something about the geothermal strategy that's in the plan or is that um, not a component of the plan at all um, I didn't see the, there wasn't a whole lot of specificity about geothermal uh, in the plan. I believe what you're gonna see, um, if the clean heat standard uh, happens, which I, I hope it will, we'll, it's gonna take a lot of work to get into, the, to for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to write the regulations that would go with the clean heat standard. But essentially, that could be the kind of thing that provides uh, money or, uh, or an incentive to the gas utility or to heating oil dealers to um, uh, incentivize or to make a geothermal project happen. Um, and so uh, I think that's the, the best chance for something like geothermal or heat pumps in general or weatherization, I think will be coming out of the, um, the back end of, of um, or, or the, the result of something that occurs because of the clean heat standard. Great, thanks for that. Um, there's definitely more questions which we can get to at the end, but for the sake of time, we're gonna move on to transportation. Um, Larry made this point earlier as we were talking about the background for the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, but transportation is the largest emitting sector in Massachusetts. And uh, part of the difficulty of the transportation sector is while we've seen emissions from electricity decrease over time, as we've gotten uh, more renewables onto the grid, um, we have not seen a downward trend for transportation emissions. And that's largely because as vehicles have gotten to be more efficient, 
uh, they've also, we've all started driving more. Um, and so the increase in vehicle miles traveled has offset any improvements that we might have gotten because of cars have gotten more efficient over time. Um, so you can see on the left there, the big chunk of the pie that transportation is responsible for, and also the trend um, from the last couple of years where you see um, emissions haven't budged very much um, at all. And so uh, when you take a bit of a closer look at where emissions are coming from, it becomes clear that light duty vehicles, so in other words, passenger cars and trucks, are responsible for the majority of climate warming emissions. Um, this is just greenhouse gas emissions. So those are the ones that are responsible for contributing to climate change. Um, if you looked at a uh, chart of where our health harming pollution comes up from, it would look a little different. That mostly comes from the medium and heavy duty vehicles that burn diesel which does release more particulates and is more polluting from a health perspective. Um, but in either case, both contribute quite a bit to transportation emissions. Um, and so those are the, the focus of the clean energy and climate plan. So the light duty vehicles really, um, that's where we're gonna get the majority of our climate reduction. And then the medium and heavy duty vehicles is where we can make sure that everyone sees the benefits of vehicle electrification um, equitably to make sure that communities are getting cleaner air as we make this transition to electric transportation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, as indicated, we have a very long way to go to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. Um, you can see uh, the goals to um, decrease emissions um, aren't quite as high as some of the other sectors in part because it's expected that transportation is gonna be harder because we're extremely dependent on gas powered vehicles. And so the strategy is to be able to shift to electric vehicles and also to be able to encourage people to use modes that don't use fossil fuels at all. So biking, walking, using transit um, is gonna be uh, more challenging than perhaps the electricity sector, which has a long history of a downward trajectory. Um, so the emissions reduction for 2030 is expected to be around 34% specifically from transportation sector. Um, and funnily enough, if you look at the numbers for 2020, that seems like we made quite a bit of progress in that year. But the thing to remember is that um, folks were largely staying home and not driving as much as they would in a typical year. So even though we see a 22% reduction compared to 1990 levels for that uh, particular year, it's unlikely that we're gonna see that in 2021 and 2022. Um, I've certainly seen traffic come back and with that emissions are coming back. And so we can't really look at that number for 2020 and think like we're on the right path because in fact that was um, more of an aberration than anything else. Um, so, uh, the, the years ahead are gonna be really important to kind of change the tide on that and make sure that we can um, uh, not get lulled into a false sense of security because of that one year. So the big picture for the transportation section of the clean energy and climate plan is really, um, there's two things. The first is to reduce the number of miles that we travel by um, vehicle, so that's you know, improving active mobility, getting more people on transit, things like that. Um, and also the second strategy is to rapidly electrify the vehicles that are currently powered by gasoline and diesel. Um, there was a question that came in earlier about creating jobs and how we can make sure that um, those jobs are created. And when it comes to installing EV infrastructure, that's largely going to take care of itself. Um, there are lots of electricians who are already trained for this work and the scale of the number of charging stations that we're gonna need in order to support EVs um, or electric vehicles is going to increase dramatically. So it's a matter of making sure that we have training programs to get people, um, to get more people trained for these jobs. Um, but really a lot of these exist. It's just a matter of uh, increasing that volume and making sure that we can keep up with it, what's coming. Um, and it's worth noting, Larry made this point earlier, these are gonna be new jobs, not replacing old fossil fuel jobs, right? So Massachusetts does not really have a, a petroleum-based economy. We don't refine it, we don't drill for it here. 
Um, and so these are going to be new opportunities coming to folks in Massachusetts, um, improving our economy and having those um, kind of downstream benefits. So it's really advantageous. Um, I'm going to quickly go through a lot of the strategies that are um, outlined here, but um, these slides are going to be shared after the presentation's over, so feel free to go back and take a closer look um, if you're curious. But uh, the first strategy is something that didn't exist in the uh, draft of the Clean Energy and Climate Plan that came out in 2020, and so this is all new. And the point of it is to help people create um, or have other options besides having to drive a gas-powered car everywhere. So that means expanding um, housing density to make sure that uh, new housing is also located where there is uh, accessible and off-running transit so that people can um, easily access job opportunities and all of their daily needs without having to get into a car. So a change in zoning and density is actually going to make a big difference in that. And we already see um, uh, changes to state law regarding that. So that's in the works. Um, there's also other efforts to make sure that the bus system transitions to an all electric fleet. That's gonna not only clean up the emissions that come from um, the current diesel-based system, but it's also going to improve air quality for folks that take the bus. So we see that as a big win for environmental justice as well. Um, there's also efforts to make sure that um, uh, when streets are redesigned um, or repaved, uh, there's going to be an effort to add options for walking and biking as well so that we can start to redesign our roads in ways that make it easier for people to um, feel safe in a bike or walking instead of having to drive everywhere, even for um, short distances. And then there's a couple of other ideas about trying to encourage state employees to um, uh, commute using alternative means as well um, and to establish an electric uh, an electric bike incentive program um, which would be really great because we're seeing electric bikes are true car replacers um, folks that ride e-bikes may be able to travel further distances or carry heavier loads than they otherwise would be um, and so we see that as an important um, strategy moving forward um, another strategy is to simply adopt stronger regulations when it comes to vehicles. California is the leader on this. It's actually the only state that's allowed to set its own um, uh, vehicle regulations uh, to require cleaner cars moving forward. Massachusetts has been able to take advantage of cleaner regulations coming out, out of California for a long time, um, but the ones that are uh, due to be released soon are a significant step up from that because they actually require 100% of new vehicle sales to be electric or zero emissions by 2035. So that's a huge commitment. It's not something that Massachusetts would be able to do on its own. And so simply jumping on to the existing rules and regulations coming out of California um, is really going to drive the market forward and make sure that uh, the production of electric vehicles is going to match the demand um, that we are gonna see in the coming years. And we've already seen um, regulations for clean trucks come out of California, and Massachusetts has adopted those already. So that essentially is a sales requirement. A certain percentage of the sales of trucks have to be electric um, moving forward. And uh, with a regulation like that, we're going to see more options on the market, as well as um, an increasing uh, desire for um, operators to, to buy into these vehicles. And of course, there's um, you know economic advantages to switching to electric as well because um, if you haven't seen the prices for diesel recently they're continuing to go up and so um, being able to have these vehicles that run on an alternative fuel um, will be a good deal for the business operators as well um, the third strategy is to expand electric vehicle incentives this is something that green energy consumers have been advocating for for a long time um, because although electric vehicles save drivers money on a lifetime basis, they still can be difficult to afford um, on an upfront basis, which is how a lot of people make their purchasing decisions. And so state policy can step in to make sure that the upfront cost of purchasing an EV is pretty comparable to what you would uh, see to buy a new gas powered car. And so we think that there are um, really positive reforms proposed to the existing state program 
that would not only uh, make sure that that money is being delivered into the right hands, so people that need the incentive to be able to afford the electric car, um, but also make it so that um, it's more easily accessible. So you get the incentive right when you're buying a car rather than having to apply for it later, um, as well as making sure that um, medium and heavy duty trucks are eligible for continued incentives as well. Um, at the very start of this, Larry mentioned the climate bill that is currently being um, negotiated in the House and the Senate of Massachusetts. And uh, those are key provisions that are in that bill and that we're looking forward to seeing when the final version comes out, hopefully this week. Electrifying fleets is part of the, um, the fourth piece of the strategy to reduce emissions from transportation. As I mentioned, this is really important to make sure that everyone not only sees the climate benefits of electric transportation, but also the, the public health and air quality benefits, because these vehicles are responsible for a majority of the uh, pollution that harms our health and um, exacerbates conditions like asthma or um, cardiovascular disease. And so there are four key focus areas that the um, state is planning on focusing on. So the first is vehicles for hire. That's your Uber, your Lyft, uh, vehicles that are performing transportation services. Um, then we have delivery trucks, school buses, um, and also um, uh, community groups that use uh, fleet vehicles. So by kind of attacking these um, key areas, the goal is to make sure that vehicles that are contributing a lot to air pollution um, are being electrified first. Um, and so for all of these, um, there aren't a whole lot of specifics in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. It's a lot of um, continuing existing programs from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center or expanding existing programs. Um, for example, the, on the school buses piece, there's lots of federal funding to be able to focus on that specifically. Um, and so we're, we are looking for more detail um, to make sure that all of these areas are um, adequately planned out. The fifth strategy is all about expanding charging infrastructure and making sure that we don't overbuild our electric system by um, uh, really largely in, uh, increasing the amount of load that electric vehicles contribute to the system at peak time. This is largely gonna be supported by federal funding from the Biden administration, um, but it also includes some things like updating building codes and making sure that EV drivers are incentivized to charge their vehicles off peak, which can act as a really strong incentive for people to switch to an electric car as well. And on that front, we've already been doing a lot of advocacy in this area. Um, to encourage the Department of Public Utilities to approve uh, a couple of utility programs from Eversource and National Grid to uh, make sure that EV drivers are uh, getting the proper incentives for charging off-peak. And so we're, we're following that closely and hope that the DPU is listening um, and reading the Clean Energy and Climate Plan closely because that was a key strategy. And then finally, um, the sixth strategy is to engage consumers and facilitate markets. Because um, as we all know, we can have plenty of electric vehicles coming down the pipeline and lots of incentives, but drivers and people in Massachusetts need to understand the technology and be excited about it. Be uh, excited to make their next car electric when they're making their next purchase decision. That's really the bread and butter of what Green Energy Consumers Alliance has been doing for a long time. Um, and we're really excited about a partnership that was specifically called out in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan related to um, some work that we're doing with a community group called uh, Quarry, which um, provides services to immigrants in the Quincy area. So uh, we're launching that program really soon, and it's all about making sure that folks in Quincy understand the benefits of electric vehicles and have access to information to be able to uh, make a low carbon uh, car buying purchase when it's their uh, time to buy a new car. So I went through that really quickly. Don't worry, we'll make sure that you all have access to the slides to dig into this a little bit more. Um, but for now, um, perhaps Larry, do you wanna take over the section on electric power and then we can answer questions? Yep, uh, thank you, Mal. Um, so what Mal talked about requires, uh, again, almost a million electric vehicles have to be adopted and a whole lot of work involving active mobility and getting people to ride public transit. Um, just like with the building sector, we're talking about 
something that affects um, a lot of people making decisions, over 2 million independent decisions about whether or not to buy a heat pump or, or an electric car and, and, and all that kind of thing. Um, now we're gonna talk about electric power, which is, um, is gonna involve decisions by a fewer number of people. And I think that's actually perhaps could be a strength. Um, we need to uh, accomplish all of these things, but uh, the emission reductions that would happen by, um, if you look at the chart, they actually think that we're gonna be holding almost steady from 2020 to 2025 with emissions rel um, of around um, 13 million metric tons of, of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, but they wanna go quite a bit further by 2030. Um, and, and of all the sectors, electricity has produced the most emissions thus far, but it we have the opportunity and we'll go into that with the next slide or two. There are a huge number of um, large, mega large offshore wind projects, and we just can't get them going fast enough. The first one that will be running is called Vineyard Wind, um, and Massachusetts will be part of that, and then uh, Mayflower Wind, and then we're going to have uh, Revolution Wind is going to serve uh, Rhode Island, and then these other projects, Bay State Wind, these other projects are going to be happening um, over the next uh, five years or so. Um, and when you uh, look back to the last couple of winters, it would have been really nice to have these projects um, in place because they cost less to run than what wintertime electricity has been costing in Massachusetts. And wait till you see your electric bill next winter. It's going to go up even further. And uh, that's happening worldwide. The, the war in Ukraine is causing natural gas prices to skyrocket. And natural gas is the number one fuel in the world for running power plants. Um, and if it gets high enough, then people start um, burning oil or coal at very high prices. Uh, offshore wind is a bargain compared to that. So what do we need to do? We do need to um, sign contracts with more offshore wind projects. But the particular um, regulation that was talked about in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan is what's called the Clean, clean Electricity Standard. Right now, um, the law says that it should be, the standard should say 40% of our power in Massachusetts would have to come from uh, wind, solar, or hydro um, by 2030. The plan is talking about changing that to 60% by 2030, which is a big jump. Um, going from 40 to 60 uh, would accomplish the reduction that they're talking about. Uh, however, this is where we this is what we feel very strongly. If there's a big weakness in the plan, it would be that um, it's depending largely upon um, making sure that we get those 1 million heat pumps, so the 1 million electric cars, and uh, a lot of it is uh, backloaded towards the later part of this decade, and we just think that we're already behind the game. We're, we're not making the emission reductions we need. We think that uh, the standard should be raised to 80 or 100% by 2030. Um, and that should be adopted as fast as possible. Um, that would be sort of like the safety net in case those other measures don't happen, we might be able to reach our goal. And if we increase the standard even further, that's gonna make every heat pump and every electric car even more effective at reducing emissions. Um, Got to say, we do work in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We are thrilled that Rhode Island passed a law just a couple weeks ago, making Rhode Island will be the first state uh, in the country to have 100% renewable energy, uh, and it'll be 100% by 2033. Um, so that number, that year is a pretty good year as well. Um, we need to get to that 100%. Uh, and they're able to do it because they're a relatively small state, but like Massachusetts, we are right next door to a huge energy resource offshore wind. Um, and so that is the main item that we're going to be talking about uh, with the next governor, is trying to increase the standard even further. Next slide. A uh, little, uh, we wanna call in uh, municipally owned utilities. Uh, they have their own standard that's separate from the clean energy standard. The clean energy standard applies to 85% of us customers of National Grid, Eversource, or Unitil. We actually regulate the investor-owned utilities 
stronger than we regulate the 41 municipal utilities that serve cities and towns in the state. Um, and they have a very weak standard called the greenhouse gas emission standard. And we think that's unfair that if we're gonna reach our goal of 50% by 2030, all ratepayers of all utilities should be paying or doing whatever it takes to reduce emissions. And so um, we will be asking the next governor uh, to go back and create some parity there. Um, lastly, uh, if you follow our organization, we just came out with a big report um, saying greener power at lower cost. And the report can be found at that link. Uh, we will send out a recording and the slides from this presentation to everybody. Uh, aggregation is producing big time uh, emission reductions in Massachusetts at zero uh, subsidy. We're doing it by uh, smart purchasing of electricity at the local level. And it didn't get one word in the uh, Clean Energy and Climate Plan. So go figure. What I can say is we'll be talking about this with the next governor. Next slide. Now, a big part of the plan, in the draft plan particularly, and also mentioned in the final plan was one way to meet our clean energy standard was to um, buy more hydropower from Hydro-Quebec. Uh, the plan has been for a few years to bring it through a transmission line through the state of Maine. Voters in the state of Maine voted to stop that. And so now the issue is in court. It's anyone's guess as to whether or not we're ever gonna get that project built, the transmission line from Canada through to Massachusetts. So what we want the governor to do is maybe find another transmission corridor, some way to connect Massachusetts uh, to Canada. One way might be through Vermont. Um, it's a project that would go uh, underneath uh, Lake Champlain. That project was ruled out a couple of years ago because it was a little bit more expensive than the transmission line through Maine. But now we all see the consequences of um, going to the lowest bidder. That project in Maine may not happen. The project through Vermont, for example, would still be cheaper than buying um, power from uh, natural gas in the coming years. And we do need to have the power to get to our emission goals. And if we're not gonna do that, it just means we have to buy more offshore wind um, and we keep building solar. But Offshore wind is the number one resource that we can get to reduce our emissions in Massachusetts. And the best part about it is most of the wind that we'll get will blow hard in the winter time. And that is the time when we need the power in order to um, feed the electric heat pumps that we're all gonna be installing. Uh, next slide. I uh, just want to remind you folks, uh, this is our 40th year as an organization. I've been here almost 23 years and we're going to keep going. I'm afraid the energy crisis is going to be with us for a long time. And if you can support us, please go to our website and make a donation. Um, we think we've done great work in 2022. We're not done. We have a lot of work to do. We have a great staff. We've got people like Mal and many others who uh, are doing a great work, who are speeding the transition to a uh, a zero carbon future. Um, one last slide maybe. And that's our contact information. You can get more information um, in the, uh, going to our blog page, um, which is there. And Mal, if you could, could you put in the chat um, the uh, link to our Shave the Peak blog uh, when you get a chance because um, that one is, um, uh, we recently wrote a blog about uh, our program called Shave the Peak that Kai Salem uh, started for us a few years ago. And that's an, uh, a program where we try to educate people about how to reduce their energy consumption during uh, what we call peak demand uh, moments on the grid. And we're going to have some of those over the next two weeks. The forecast is showing a lot of heat and um, that puts a lot of stress on, on uh, capacity in the grid. What happens is the uh, you, uh, we end up getting more electricity coming from fossil fuels that's very expensive and very dirty. So pollution will go way up. Um, but we have ways we can try to shave that peak. Um, so thank you. Uh, Mal uh, did put that into the chat. Um, you can also find it on our blog page on your own. But now a few more questions perhaps, Mal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have one that I think you probably could have guessed was coming for you, uh, which is there was a question about what the holdup is 
for the climate bill and um, what folks can do um, to kind of push that process along to make sure it, the climate bill passes this year. All right, uh, thank you for whoever asked that question. This is exactly why we're kind of doing this presentation. Um, the the House passed a very good bill about uh, that it would affect the climate. It was mainly about offshore wind. Um, they did that earlier in the spring. Later in the spring, the Senate passed a very good bill that was primarily focused on uh, transportation. Um, the and they now are in conference committee. Uh, we have been talking to legislators in both the House and the Senate. Um, we think that there's a commitment on their on their parts to pass a bill. Um, philosophically, we don't see a lot of differences but between uh, what their goals might be. I think they all want a good climate bill. I'll be uh, very honest with you. I think some of it just has to do with turf between the House and the Senate, each wanting to sort of dominate the discussion. Um, and uh, they need to stop that. Um, they need to uh, compromise. There's there's not a whole lot that they have to compromise on. I don't I don't see the major differences between the two bills that they each are working with. And uh, so now is an excellent time for you to call your legislator. Um, you can um, Mal, if you have a chance, could you drop that uh, link in about how we can get people to do that? Um, folks, as you can see, I rely on Mal for quite a bit. Um, and so now's a good time to either call or email both your state senator and your state representative. And I will say this, that if, the, if they pass it within a day or two, they will then be able to have enough time that should Governor Baker veto any part of it, the legislature could override the veto. Um, and that could be important. So we want to get them to pass it by uh, tomorrow or Thursday. And if they don't do that, then uh, the governor uh, we'll be able to veto parts of it and it, there won't be enough time. It needs to be 10 days um, uh, 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 remaining in the session for the House of Senate to override. Um, and so we want to make sure that um, happens. If the governor does veto something uh, or even the chance of the governor vetoing it, we want you to contact the, the governor's office as well. But it hasn't reached his desk yet. So right now, the um, the the House and the Senate are where it's at. Now we know that over 500 of our members have already done that. Um, if you've already done it, do it again. If you haven't done it, really, you really should. Um, Mal put into the uh, chat the link that you would need. It will um, show you how to write an email letter that will go right to them and it will uh, give you the phone number as well. Great, thanks for that update, Larry. Uh, there was a question that came in related to electric transportation, which I'm happy to take on, and then you can add if you see fit. But the question was, um, EVs are really hard to come by right now due to supply chain issues. And uh, when do we expect that will ease so that EVs can become widely available again? Um, I'll start off by saying that all new cars are in shortage, not just electric vehicles. I think the electric vehicle piece has been in the news because um, more people are learning about them and are excited about EVs because of rising gas prices. And so if you are thinking about getting a new car, um, the fact that gasoline is $5 a gallon is a strong motivator to think about getting an EV. Um, but it is all new cars at this point. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to predict the future and figure out when that's going to resolve. We do think that with all of the policy coming from a state level and also the commitment from different automakers about um, their desire to produce more electric vehicles, that'll be alleviated in the future because they're ramping up their ability to produce EVs. So as an example, Ford in the last couple of weeks announced that they are going to be opening more production facilities than they thought. Um, to meet the demand for the electric F-150 that they have coming off of production lines now. Um, but all of those things take time. And so my hope is that in the next year, year and a half, we're going to see that pressure alleviate. Um, but the exact kind of moment when it'll be much easier to buy a new electric car is, is hard to tell. Um, the other component of it is you know, just car buying is changing. Um, lots of people are finding it more convenient um, to be able to order the exact vehicle that they want um, rather than just being able to pick 
a car off the lot and whatever they have is what they have. Um, so we may see some shifts there, but there, there are definitely going to be more electric cars available for purchase in the next uh, couple of years to help meet that rising demand. Um, and we're all about making sure that consumers are ready for when they come. Anything to add there, Larry? Uh, well, that was a great answer. I guess I would add, folks, if you can hang on for a little bit longer, um, we're going to be seeing uh, the production increase, as Mal said, but more new cars, electric cars, are coming onto the market. So if you don't see one that exactly fits your needs, it's going to be here. So what, we're, what we want you to think about is um, make your next car an electric car. Um, as Mal said, the price of gasoline-powered cars is going up. They are in short supply. All the car makers are spending more to build on, on uh, manufacturing of electric cars now than gasoline powered cars. So you're going to see that where um, the weights for gasoline powered cars will continue. And eventually, I think we'll start seeing more EVs available. Uh, already right now, uh, sales of gasoline powered cars are declining and sales of EVs are increasing, even with what we see as a shortage of them. Absolutely. Um, I have a question that is a bit of a shift to talking about buildings. And the question is, how do we do a better job of dispelling information that the real estate industry is releasing about the cost of all electric construction? Yeah, uh, well, honestly, I think what we're going to have to do is um, hope that the legislature understands that new construction uh, can produce um, uh, buildings that, that, that are cheaper over the life cycle of the building to to uh, heat and power. Um, it's really in their, uh, uh, it's in their court right now at the legislature. Um, once it gets past them, we've got to work on the governor's office on the regulations involving the stretch code. Um, what's here, what's it, what's key here is a building that's built today is going to last a long time. And we've, we've already committed ourselves in Massachusetts to having essentially net zero by 2050. And so if you build a building today that has uh, fossil fuel heating, whether natural gas or whatever, uh, what are we going to do uh, when we get closer to 2050? Are we going to um, are we, are we going to have that facility heated by fossil fuels for just a short amount of time? Uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I, so we, we do need to uh, encourage um, the, the construction. Of, and, and so one of the big issues is whether or not cities and towns should have the option of, of uh, banning um, natural gas hookups, for example, or fossil fuel uh, heating. Um, I think that's something that hopefully will survive in the, in the climate bill. Great. Thanks for that. Um, we still have some questions coming in, but we are already five minutes past the hour. So I'm just going to prioritize one final one that I know will get a fun, energetic answer from Larry. But if you have more questions from the audience that we didn't get to, our email addresses are on the screen. Um, so feel free to reach out. But the question is about um, the fact that 20 towns have been waiting for more than two years for approval from the Department of Public Utilities about their green municipal aggregation plans. Why is that? And what can we do about it? Uh, this has been something we've been uh, agitating about for a couple of years because um, every plan by a community over the last couple of years that has eventually gone through the process it's taken longer than it should. Um, almost all the plans that have been filed are about the same. The DNA of the plans are about the same. And so it should take uh, maybe a couple of months to get approval in, in, in our viewpoint. In some cases, they've taken over a year. Um, so the Department of Public Utilities has not given us a reasonable answer as to why they're taking so long. And uh, so I'll just put it very bluntly. I think we need new people at the Department of Public Utilities and I'm hoping the next governor will make that happen so that they see aggregation uh, for the benefits that, that it is providing to the state, both in terms of uh, more renewable energy, less greenhouse gases, and doing it very, very affordably. And it's all in our report, which is on our website. Awesome. Hoping uh, folks will be able to, to check that out. But if not, we'll make sure to send out a, 
follow-up email to this webinar that has that information so it's easy for you to find. Um, with that, I'm going to say this was a great hour that we spent talking about what Massachusetts is planning on doing in its uh, clean energy and climate plan. And um, I'll just say that Green Energy Consumers is going to be on it, making sure that the plan um, is executed to its fullest capacity. So um, thank you so much for all of you who support our work. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you so much for staying engaged uh, with us for this hour as we talked about what we've been working on. Um, have a good rest of your afternoon. Take care and shave the peak. <laughs>